St. Matthew either records our Lord's sermon at a different time where the Lord went into more detail, or else St. Matthew is giving us an amplified translation to help us understand what our Lord meant by poverty. So he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Spiritual poverty is a recognition that in ourselves, we have no good thing to offer God. That no good thing comes out of our own nature. Spiritual poverty is the recognition that any good, any virtue that inheres in us is a gift of the Lord. Spiritual poverty is a kind of spiritual posture of perpetually standing with an open hand as a beggar before the Lord to receive from Him any goodness, any virtue, any grace that we need. It's an acknowledgement that we are in total dependence upon Him and that every day we need that gift of grace. Every day we need that daily bread. This is very much related to the Lord's Prayer, but we'll have to wait for a moment for the exposition of that. But it is this posture of standing before the Lord with an open hand, begging for our need, knowing that in ourselves we have nothing. As the Catechism says, the saints were very much aware that even their merits were the gifts of God's grace. This is really the answer to Luther's angst, Luther's self-conflict, Lutheran theology and salvation by faith alone and so on. A lot of that comes out of the fact that Luther was just afraid for his salvation and he realized that he had nothing good in himself, right? If Luther had just embraced the theology of the Sermon on the Mount, it would have resolved this. What Luther was trying to get at was this posture of spiritual poverty, but he went about it the wrong way and ended up making errors. And so, you know, that, that's what we have in the history of Protestantism. In any event, this is the heart of the church, Many non-Catholics think that we think that we're earning brownie points or storing up treasure every time we go to Mass or every time we pray a rosary. Okay, this is a caricature outside the church. Although there's some Catholics who probably think that, you know, think in this way, like I'm, I'm building up, you know, my own merit or something like this. I get a spiritual coin every time I, you know, recite the Our Father, you know, look at all my spiritual coins, some, some of you like this. But what does our Lord say? Blessed are the poor in spirit who realize that they are completely dependent on God and come with an empty hand seeking grace. Now, let's talk about the relationship with temporal poverty. Although our Lord is talking about spiritual poverty primarily, there is a relationship with temporal poverty. Because wealth is typically an obstacle to spiritual poverty. Why is wealth an obstacle? Because wealth creates attachments. The more you have, the more you want. The more you have things, the more you become attached to the things. The more your focus is taken away from spiritual riches and focused on earthly riches. The person who recognizes their spiritual poverty also recognizes that true wealth is spiritual and not temporal. And so the person that recognizes spiritual poverty becomes wrapped up with meeting the need of that spiritual poverty, of filling that spiritual poverty by receiving grace from God. If you're wrapped up in re receiving spiritual riches from God with an empty hand, you can't at the same time be trying to accumulate Lexuses, what is it, Lexi, <laughs> be the plural, you know, and, and gadgetry and boats, you know, and yachts, and uh, I mean, who needs a yacht really, you know, and mansions, you know, and all this stuff. If you're wrapped up in all that stuff takes a lot of effort to attain, you know, and, and, and your, your priorities are disordered. If you're trying to gain those riches rather than to fulfill your spiritual poverty because you recognize that you are spiritually poor. And our Lord is going to expound on this later when he talks about serving God or mammon. So there is very much a relationship with temporal poverty. Our Lord will say it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why is it hard for the rich man to enter? Because your temporal riches create pride. They create self-confidence. I don't need God. I have all this money in the bank. I've got plenty of food to eat. I've got a, you know, an IRA. I have you know, four cars. If one breaks down, you know, I've got my own jet, whatever. You know. I have all this stuff. Why do I need God? It leads to pride. It leads to self-sufficiency. And so it becomes an obstacle to recognizing um, our spiritual poverty. And for this reason, many saints have understood the, the phrase poor in spirit 
in another very defensible sense, and that would be poor for the sake of the Spirit. Blessed are those who become temporally poor for the sake of spiritual ends. And all Christians are called to live this temporal poverty. Obviously, in the religious life, you take a vow of poverty, and you understand that very well. We could call it a kind of a radical embrace of our Lord's counsel to live poverty. But lay people as well are called to live it. The Jews of Jesus' day did not understand this concept. You know, when we think about the Pharisees, for example, the Pharisees associated wealth with success also in the spiritual realm. The Pharisees understood wealth as God's blessing on you, and so if you're wealthy, it must mean you're also righteous because you're being blessed by God, temporal blessings of the covenant. Not only that, but in the Jewish system of our Lord's day, staying pure, staying ritually clean, which is very important, for example, for the Pharisees, required a certain amount of leisure and wealth. If you bumped into something unclean, you had to stop what you were doing and go and wash. Well, if you're a working man and you barely make enough each day to feed yourself or, or your, your little family, okay, you can't stop work just because you ran into a dog or something or, or touched a dead animal inadvertently. You can't stop work and go and go through a long system of purification for three days, etc. You don't have that option. So the common person in Jesus' day was not able to keep the ritual law and the ritual purity. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees were able to keep these ritual laws, but they tended to be the wealthy people who had the leisure to be able to do this. They had ritual baths in their own homes in Jerusalem, so that if they got impure, they could bathe right there. They didn't have to run outside of town or something to be ritually clean. Okay? Again, the, the common poor person didn't have this luxury. So in the mind of the Jews of Jesus' day, wealth was associated with great spirituality and staying richly clean. And this is why the disciples are shocked, for example, when the Lord says, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. They say, huh? Oh, if even the rich can't enter, who have ritual baths in their homes, and they're, you know, they touch anything clean, and boom, they're in the bath, and out the other side, and, and <laughs> keep, keeping the law, and, you know, always in, in a state so that they can go into the temple, and they have big homes right next to the temple so they can worship there a lot and offer sacrifices. I mean, if even those people can't be saved, you know, how can anybody be saved? So this is the reaction. There was this association with wealth, with purity. That is a kind of a heresy that's come up at different times in church history as well. I came out of the Calvinist tradition. In some branches of the Calvinist tradition, temporal wealth is associated with God's blessing, so people would try to be wealthy because it looks like they're blessed by God, etc. On TV, you know, you'll hear the health and wealth gospel preached by various televangelists. Usually involves sending in a donation, and then you're going to become wealthy. You know, got to give big to get big, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. You know, you have these preachers with big ministries driving large cars and fabulous churches that are very elegant and all this kind of thing. That's not really the spirit of, of what our Lord talks about when he says being poor in spirit. I want to come back to this issue of the relationship between spiritual poverty and temporal poverty. Those who are spiritually poor also ought to practice forms of temporal poverty. It doesn't necessarily mean that all wealth needs to be given up that you can't possess anything, but it describes your lifestyle. I like an example used by St. Jose Maria Escriva. When asked about this subject, he, he told a little story. He said, when he was a young priest and ministered in Madrid, he ministered among the poor at what we would think of as soup kitchens where the poor were fed. And he noticed this certain man that would always come into the soup kitchen for lunch and get his bowl of food and then go off into a corner. And this poor man was dressed in shabby clothing and so on, didn't seem to have any possessions, but when he would sit down in the corner with his bowl of food, he would pull out a silver spoon out from his clothing, and he would polish up that silver spoon, and then he'd look both ways, make sure nobody was trying to edge into him, and then he would eat his food carefully with that silver spoon. And then when he got done eating his food, he'd polish up that spoon again, tuck it away where nobody could find it, okay? This was his precious, okay? This was... <laughs> He had a disordered attachment, poor as he was, had a disordered attachment to his one possession. 
this man was not free. Okay? He was not free from temporal attachments. Contrasting that, St. Josemaria knew a, a certain Comtessa, a countess, a Spanish countess, who had an enormous estate and was heir of a large number of lands that had come down to her from her ancestors back to medieval times. This Comtessa lived a very austere life in her mansion, eating a simple diet, wearing simple clothes. She did not dispossess herself of all her lands, but she supported several religious orders from the wealth that came to her from her rents. She sold off some of her jewels and some of her possessions to support institutions for the poor. And when St. Josemaria himself was in need, he would often go to her and ask if she could you know, provide some of the temporal means that he needed for various ministries that he was founding. And this woman was living a life of self-denial. Okay? She was living a life of penance and a life of austerity, even though she had the title to this property. And then she was guiding the use of her property towards the benefit of the poor and of the church and so on. She was living temporal poverty, even though she owned a lot. So poor in spirit can refer to poor for the sake of the spirit. It means primarily spiritual poverty, but it's nonetheless tied to living a form of temporal poverty as well. The temporal poverty that we want to live is a denial of self-indulgence. It's a denial of self-indulgence because temporal indulgence is ultimately incompatible with spiritual poverty. 